Sir Isaac Newton's Daniel and the Apocalypse with an introductory study of the nature and the cause of unbelief of miracles and prophecy by Sir William Whitla, MP, MD, DSC, LLD, Emeritus Professor, Queen's University, Belfast, Honorable MA, MD, LLD, and DSC. London, John Murray, Almarle Street, West, 1922. Read for Noetic by Luke Johnson and a friend. This recording copyright 2019 Noetic Series, LLC, all rights reserved. To William Branwell Booth, General of the Salvation Army, who with his illustrious father has accomplished so much among the nations of the world towards the hastening of the coming of the kingdom, predicted in the book of Daniel. The volume is affectionately and reverently dedicated. Forward. Among these are certainly some rather dry and unattractive questions in respect of which we must arm ourselves with patience. But they are all of the greatest practical importance. You meet a thousand times in life with those who, in dealing with any religious question, make at once their appeal to reason and insist on forthwith rejecting aught that lies beyond its sphere. Without, however, being able to render any clear account of the nature and proper limits of the knowledge thus derived, or of the relation in which such knowledge stands to the religious needs of man. I would invite you, therefore, to inquire seriously whether such persons are not really bowing down before an idol of the mind which, while itself of very questionable worth, demands as much implicit faith from its worshippers as divine revelation itself. Theodor Kreislieb, D.D. Preface It had been the intention of the author of the following lectures to issue a reprint of the forgotten classic of the great astronomer and philosopher, Sir Isaac Newton, entitled Observations Upon the Prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John, published in 1733. The great astronomer died in 1727, having left the work in manuscript. It was printed in London as a small quarto, it was included in Horsley's collection, 1779. A very considerable amount of its letterpress was in Latin, consisting of the quotations from the edicts of the emperors and the bulls of the popes, as well as extracts from the early fathers of the Christian church, historians, and church councils. Though it was very desirable that the reprint should be presented as an exact facsimile of the original volume, upon serious consideration, it appeared necessary to have the Latin text translated into English. Otherwise, these portions of the book would have been intelligible only to scholars. It is needless to say that this decision was arrived at with regret and only after balancing the arguments in favor of an exact facsimile, which would be more acceptable to scholars and book lovers with the advantages which range themselves on the side of practical usefulness. Accordingly, the translation of the Latin portions has been entrusted to Mr. W. H. Semple, B.A., Assistant to the Professor of Greek, at Queen's University, Belfast. Otherwise, the reprint is an exact reproduction, save for the substitution of modern type 
and the omission of the old Fs. The frequent use of italics throughout the pages is in accordance with the manuscripts of Sir Isaac Newton. In these days of highly expensive printing, another difficulty was encountered. If the book was to reach any considerable number of readers, its price must be made as moderate as possible. This obstacle is met by the issue of the present volume at a price not above the cost of publication. A word of explanation is necessary regarding the origin of the introductory portion of the book. A few months ago, the writer was earnestly requested to deliver an address of the book of Daniel to the members of the church to which he belongs by their minister. After considerable hesitation, he assented. But on sitting down to think over such an address, its execution became an evident impossibility to lay anything intelligible or helpful to an audience of laymen within the compass of a single communication or speech about the prophecies in the book was not possible without an attempt to clear away the doubts and myths of unbelief with which the higher critics had succeeded in enveloping this sacred record. The solitary address gradually lengthened itself into a series of five lectures and still left the undertaking far from completion. The lectures are printed verbatim as they were delivered. They are not to be taken in any sense as an attempted commentary or series of explanatory notes on the work of the illustrious philosopher. Such a presumption never once entered into their author's mind, and he hopes it will not seem an absurdity or folly that his more or less crude reflection should be placed inside the same cover in proximity with the august and scholarly researches in this 200-year-old gem of biblical literature. The only excuse or apology might be stated to lie in the fact that when this antique volume was written, the destructive German critic had not appeared above the horizon. If a devout student of the present time should succeed in arriving at a clear understanding of the truths entombed in the book of Daniel, he would soon meet some confident mentor who would be certain to assure him that all his labor was folly as the scholars had proved the book to be a forgery, and the higher critics had long since entirely demolished its authenticity. These lectures are an attempt to make clear the unreality of the modern criticism, and to leave open the study of the book of Daniel, as it was when Newton, in strong and childlike faith, lent his mighty intellect to the study of this fascinating record. Should the introductory portion of this volume prove an entire failure, there is left to the author the solid consolation that he has been highly privileged in his master's service by being permitted to restore to the biblical student Sir Isaac Newton's valuable contribution to the study of the Babylonian prophet. William Whitla, Lennox Vale, Belfast, March 1922. Contents, Part 1, Introduction to Sir Isaac Newton's Daniel and the Apocalypse, Chapter 1, Science and Unbelief, Spiritualism, Rationalism, the Supernatural, Natural Laws, Miracles, Views of Scientific Men, Dallinger on the Harmony of Miracle and Science, Vegetable Life, a Miracle, Christianity Rests on a Miracle, Evolution Theory and the Genesis Record, Einstein Theory, Ether and God, pages 3 through 17. Chapter 2, The Higher Criticism in Relation to Unbelief. Two Types of Higher Criticism, the English and German. Textual Criticism Most Valuable, A Warning, the Shakespearean Theories, the Higher German Criticism, the Result Not the Cause of Unbelief, 
Cheyenne and Driver and Farrar failure of the higher criticism and Emil Reich's verdict. Pages 18 through 25. Chapter 3 The Science of Unbelief. Unbelief very often unconsciously assumed. Study of the commonest type of infidel or rationalist. The five special senses. Abnormalities of these. Color blindness and musical deafness. Theologians' views of faith, belief or faith, a sixth special sense, analogies with the other composite senses, atheist as a God-blind or God-deaf person with imperfectly developed brain center for belief faculty, responsibility, inspiration, prophecy, miracle, prayer, wireless telegraphy, considered from this point of view. Pages 26 through 44. Chapter 4. Prophecy and Unbelief. Nature and Function of Prophecy, Not Mere Foretelling. Classification. Fulfilled and Unfulfilled Predictions. Vital Importance of a Knowledge of the Former Group. Prophecy Mongering. Higher Criticism Views. Date of the Older Books, Lost Book of the Law, A Forgery, Debt to the Hebrew Race, pages 45 through 56. Chapter 5, The Messianic Prophecies, Modernist Views, Symbolic Prophecy, Messianic Prophecies to be Studied as a Complete Picture and Not Piecemeal, Necessity for Cryptic Language, List beginning in paradise, events from birth of Christ till the ascension foretold, genealogy of Matthew and Luke contrasted, passion, crucifixion, burial predictions, Psalm 22 analyzed, summary of fulfillment, pages 57 through 69. Chapter 6. The Book of Daniel and Unbelief. Sketch of period, gap between Old and New Testament history, Antiochus Epiphanes, testimony of Ezekiel, Pseudepigrapha, testimony of Christ on the authenticity of the book, pages 70 through 77. Chapter 7, Daniel and the Closing of the Canon. Testimony of Josephus and of the writer of Esdras, the Great Synagogue, the Hagiographa, evidences of date from Maccabees, Baruch, Sirach, and other apocryphal books, Josephus and Alexander the Great, Evolutionary Theory of the Modernists, pages 78 through 85. Chapter 8. Alleged Historical Inaccuracies in the Book of Daniel German Critics and the Authorship and Date of Daniel Surrender of Jehoiakim Identity of Belshazzar Proven by Monumental Evidence Darius the Mede and the Tablet of Cyrus Ezra Chapter 5 Objections Based on Philology Disproven Doctrine of Angels Pages 86-94 through 94. Chapter 9, The Prophecies in the Book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's Dream, The Kingdom of Christ, The Vision of the Four Beasts, The Little Horn of the Fourth Roman Beast, Identification of this with the Papacy, Kingdom of Christ Again Foretold, Time and Times and Half a Time, Revelation 13, The Prophetic Year, Vision of Ram and He-Goat, the Little Horn of the Greek Goat, the Prophetic Time in the Last Verses of the Book, Vision of the Tenth Chapter, Alexander's Generals, Other Prophecies in this Chapter, pages 95 through 116. Chapter 10, The Prophecy of the Seventy Weeks. Daniel's Prayer and the Period of the Desolations, This Prophecy, the Keystone of Christianity, Isaac Newton's View of the Starting Point, 
the second advent, the 62 weeks of verse 26, the four decrees of the Persian emperors, 69 weeks fulfilled to the day in the proclamation of the Messiah, the different messiahs of the German critics, Cyrus, Zerubbabel, Ananias, and Seleucus Philopater, the 70th week still unfulfilled, pages 117 to 128. Part 2. Observations upon the prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John. Part 1. Observations upon the prophecies of Daniel. Chapter 1. Introduction concerning the compilers of the books of the Old Testament, pages 139 through 148. Chapter 2. Of the prophetic language, pages 149 through 153. Chapter 3. Of the vision of the image composed of four metals. Pages 154 through 156. Chapter 4 of the Vision of the Four Beasts. Pages 157 through 159. Of the kingdoms represented by the feet of the image composed of iron and clay. Pages 160 through 169. Chapter 6 of the Ten Kingdoms represented by the Ten Horns of the Fourth Beast. Pages 170 through 187. Chapter 7, of the 11th horn of Daniel's fourth beast, pages 188 to 197. Chapter 8, of the power of the 11th horn of Daniel's fourth beast to change times and laws, pages 198 to 216. Chapter 9, of the kingdoms represented in Daniel by the ram and he goat, pages 217 to 224. Chapter 10, of the Prophecy of the Seventy Weeks, pages 225 to 234. Chapter 11 of the Times of the Birth and Passion of Christ, pages 235 to 250. Chapter 12 of the Prophecy of the Scripture of Truth, pages 251 to 266. Chapter 13 of the King who did according to his will and magnified himself above every god and honored Mahuzams, and regarded not the desire of women, pages 267 to 272. Chapter 14. Of the Mahuzams honored by the king who doth according to his will, pages 273 to 291. Part 2. Observations upon the Apocalypse of St. John. Chapter 1. Introduction concerning the time when the Apocalypse was written, pages 295 to 307. Chapter 2. Of the relation which the Apocalypse of John hath to the book of the laws of Moses and to the worship of God in the temple, pages 308 to 321. Chapter 3. Of the relation which the prophecy of John hath to those of Daniel and of the subject of the prophecy. Pages 322 to 342. Advertisement. The last pages of these observations having been differently drawn up by the author in another copy of his work. They are here inserted as they follow in that copy, after the 37th line of the 312th page foregoing. Pages 343 to 351. Index Pages 353 to 356. Part 1. Introduction to Sir Isaac Newton's Daniel and the Apocalypse by Sir William Whitla. Chapter 1. Science and Unbelief. At no period in the history of Christianity, since Pentecostal days, has there been such a widespread spirit of unbelief as exists at the present time. In passing, let me remind you that this has been foretold as an unmistakable sign of the latter days, which are to terminate the present dispensation. Alongside of this unbelief, there has arisen, because of the late war and its aftermath of unrest and sorrow, an earnest desire upon the part of many thoughtful people to look more deeply into the problems of life and of the hereafter. 
It is perhaps true to say that at no period in the history of the human race has there been manifested a more intense longing to pierce the veil which divides us from the spirit land and to catch a glimpse, if happily we may find it, into the future destiny of the world on which we live. We see these longing desires manifested in the remarkable activity in thought and in research directed to the domains of spiritualism and prophecy. In the present stage of our knowledge, or rather of our ignorance, both of these are commonly regarded as belonging to the sphere of the supernatural. Though it is with the domain of prophecy that the following pages have to deal, a brief word may be permitted in passing on the present position of the so-called science of spiritualism. The current literature of the day is teeming with reports, some of which are emanating from men eminent in science and literature about researches and investigations in the realm of the spirit world. A much larger proportion of these, however, owe their origin to untrained and unscientific minds, which are bringing the entire project into ridicule and even obloquy, just as the past and present prophecy mongers have brought derision upon those devout scholars who have attempted to illuminate the field of unfulfilled prophecy. Upon the whole, the results of experimental research in the spirit sphere must be regarded at the present stage of investigation as disappointing. A careful sifting out of the facts already discovered when separated from the mass of theories and assumptions regarding thought reading, thought transference, telepathy, suggestion, and other functions of the subconscious mind should compel the searcher after truth to adopt the attitude of an open mind till conclusive proof of communication with the spirits who have passed over has been demonstrated. This cannot be said to have been proven by the results so far achieved. If we can ever hope to arrive at the final haven of truth, it can only be by steering straight between the whirlpools of credulity and skepticism. It is difficult to estimate which is the more formidable peril, a gross state of superstition which greedily accepts every marvel or a self-satisfied rationalism which scornfully rejects every fact and problem not susceptible of solution by the unaided reason. We shall deal at length with these mental peculiarities or configurations later on. Our present purpose is to deal with that form of unbelief which tends towards the rejection of divine inspiration, as revealed in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. The most disquieting fact, however, lies not in the mere increase in the number of unbelievers, the position of today as contrasted with that of a quarter or half a century ago consists in the fact that the moral leprosy has eaten into the very heart of the church itself. As we shall see, the spread of unbelief amongst the multitude who seldom attend the service of any church is more apparent than real. We constantly hear the anointed ambassadors of Christ unblushingly deny the inspiration of the Bible, the possibility of prophecy and miracle, and the divinity of our crucified and risen Savior. There is, however, one gleam of comfort to my auditors in the deep gloom surrounding the political situation in our beloved island when we deplore such falling off. I am convinced that the Protestant churches in Ireland are still cherishing, and as they never cherished before, their strong faith in God and in His revealed will. Doubtless our advanced brethren in England pity us as being quite behind the times in this respect. God grant that we ever shall remain so, without any haze of modernism or cloud of rationalism 
to weaken our vision of his radiant presence. Time does not permit me to enter into an elaborate analysis of the degrees or varieties of unbelief. Skepticism, atheism, pantheism, deism, agnosticism, materialism, rationalism, etc. The parent of all these is rationalism, and it may, in a general sense, be made to stand for them all. As commonly defined, rationalism is a religion which makes reason supreme in all matters of religion. Rejecting revelation, it attempts to derive all truth from mere human reason. To make our subject as simple as possible, it will suffice to confine our attention to a still shorter definition. Rationalism or unbelief denies the possibility of the supernatural. This brief sentence brings the conception of the nature of unbelief within the compass of a nutshell. Put out of your thoughts the numerous confusing and conflicting isms and grasp the simple truth that the absence of faith or unbelief for all practical purposes simply means inability or incapacity to accept the supernatural and in its most advanced form means inability to accept the existence of a personal God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, made manifest in the flesh. We must next consider what is meant by the word supernatural. It is something which is beyond or above the established course or laws of nature. Perhaps no scientific man of the present day would venture to affirm that he thoroughly understands or knows all that may ultimately be expected to be known about any single law of nature. Some event, appearance, or phenomenon which our reasoning powers fail to explain as being the result of the operation of any known natural law is regarded as supernatural. Science discovers the unknown and mysterious law tomorrow, and the marvel is relegated properly to the domain of the natural, and can be reproduced and repeated at the will of the discoverer. This is observed in the development of the new popular science wrongly called spiritualism. Many of the phenomena about whose reality there cannot be a shadow of doubt are obviously the result of the operation of some natural law or laws of which we at present know absolutely nothing. For example, a chair, table, or other piece of furniture is seen suspended in midair without any visible aid in opposition to the law of gravitation. In this position, it is photographed by an honest photographer the votaries of spiritualism affirm that the material object is raised and supported in space by the aid of departed spirits. Just as reasonably might they maintain that the suspension, or so-called levitation, was due to the pattern of the wallpaper of the room in which the experiment was conducted. You tell the pedantic rationalist of this marvel, he denies it. He confidently affirms no such thing ever happened or ever can happen. You show him the photograph, he scornfully glances at it and replies with a sneer that it is faked. The story is a lie, a fraud, or a mere delusion, like the appearance of the angelic host at Mons or the presence of the angel at Houston Railway Station as reported a few months ago. I wish you to notice that this is the exact attitude of the rationalistic unbeliever with regard to miracles. He denies the possibility of such a phenomenon simply because his reason fails to explain how it was brought about, and he almost feels himself to be worthy of being regarded as a man of science by denying it. Before viewing the subject of miracles in the searching light of true and most advanced science, Permit me to quote the powerful pronouncement of an able and scholarly divine, the Reverend A. H. T. Clark in the 19th century, January 1921. The miraculous means the impinging of what we call the supernatural order upon the so-called natural order. In theory, we may say that in the supernatural order, God acts directly, in the natural, indirectly. 
But what, after all, is the so-called natural order? It is no more than the few sequences of phenomena we are able, with our local instruments, to observe and classify. A miracle, according to Hume's ingenious sneer, is contrary to human experience. And if it were not, it would cease to be a miracle. If so, then before the microscope was invented, we must have disbelieved in the animaculae that inhabit our bodies. Or before Newton was born, we must have denied gravitation. Or before Huxley had grown old, the fact of radium. And there are still some who deny such modern discoveries of psychic research as the fact of levitation. With St. John, miracles are no isolated wonder. They are natural radiations from the personal magnetism of the eternal sun, displaying not causal proof of superhuman power, but visible flashes of that really abiding deathless world which was his home. And how could such a person come into our world as the universal church bears witness that he did and display the perfect freedom of his own perfect will without, to us miraculously, disturbing the orderly sequence of his own creation? If miracles did not happen, then he never dwelt amongst us, and his church is built either upon a pleasant dream or a deliberate lie when it proclaimed him in the words of Anselm, At des at non bonus. On this ground of the miraculous, so confidently denied by some modernist bishops and some modernist deans as true representatives of the modern logic ridden mind, the church of the future must be prepared to give battle or go down to the dust heaps of a benighted superstition. Let us now look at the subject of miracles from the standpoint of the scientist who still retains his belief in a personal God, for we must not lose our sense of proportion, because hostile critics glibly quote scientific statements which often they do not understand. This is no reason why one should think that revealed religion and science are antagonistic or opposed to each other. On the contrary, Many of the greatest men of science that the world has ever known were men with the strongest faith in God and the most devout believers in the inspiration of the Bible. It is generally, indeed, nearly always the man with a superficial acquaintance with the laws and facts of science who holds forth loudly against belief. In no other sphere or domain of knowledge is the truism so applicable. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. There shall draughts intoxicate the brain, and drinking largely sobers us again. Bacon, who is often called the father of science, said the same thing and applied it to the influence of a knowledge of science upon the conception of God. A little philosophy inclineth a man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. One hundred years later, we find the greatest human intellect, possibly with the exception of that of Shakespeare, Sir Isaac Newton, devoutly unfolding the secrets of Daniel's mysterious prophecies and visions with a simple childlike faith that has never been excelled. I shall have the privilege at a subsequent lecture of surprising you with some of his discoveries in the domain of interpretation as handed down to us in the forgotten English classic written by our greatest astronomer and scientist. It was a joy in my own life to have possessed the sacred friendship of one of the most original of our medical scientific pioneers. In the earlier years of our intercourse, I can recall his attempts in solemn or serious conversation to explain the miracles by the application of the ordinarily accepted methods of obtaining results by man's ingenuity in employing natural laws. For example, he, Sir Lauder Brunton, was quite convinced that Joshua, the son of Nun, was an expert sapper and miner who mined the foundations of the walls of Jericho before submitting them to the powerful trumpet blasts and the loud rhythmic shouts of the myriads of fighting men. 
As my friend grew older and his scientific research has led him more deeply into the secrets of nature and nearer to the heart of the great creator, he found complete rest by accepting the divine record without reservation. It was my great privilege to be with him towards the end of his saintly and pure life, and I almost felt that it would not have been an inconceivable thing for a chariot of flame to have carried him home in triumph. Some of us are old enough to remember the tempest of indignation which was aroused in our Belfast religious world by the presidential address of Professor Tyndall when the British Association visited our city in the early 70s of the last century. It was banned as subversive of all faith in God, and the author was held up as infidelity and atheism incarnate in most of our churches. And we still occasionally hear his name paraded by rationalists as one of the champions of unbelief. Many years afterwards, when he revisited Belfast, he was suffering from an incurable form of insomnia or sleeplessness. I was introduced to him by his kind host as a physician who might be able to afford him some relief. He was profoundly depressed and shaking his head despairingly. He replied by stating his malady was beyond the range of art, but suddenly looking up intently, he exclaimed, yes, you can do me some good. If you are a religious man, you can pray for me. In after years, as I got to know him more intimately, I am convinced that he spoke from deep conviction. A friend of his early days has related to me that on one occasion, after many conversations with Professor Tyndall on the subject of religion, he said to him seriously, Ah, my friend, you have got something which I don't possess. There was a deep meaning in this expression, if you recall it to memory after our next lecture. I mentioned these incidents, which may seem trivial because public utterances of the man of science should not be accepted without a study of their context when they refer to matters of faith. Often they are but a protest against some ignorant credulity or superstition, which is itself always an injury to true belief. We may well wish that many of our religious teachers were as true in their belief as was the greatest popular exponent of science of the last century. I should weary you by the mere enumeration of men of science who were at the same time men of strong religious faith. We are sitting almost within sight of the statue erected to the memory of the illustrious Lord Kelvin, who was a devout believer and student of the sacred oracles. And anyone who had heard his opening prayer at the commencement of his daily lecture in the University of Glasgow could never doubt his sincerity. I was recently struck by a remarkable utterance of Herbert Spencer made in his later years. We hear his views quoted like those of Tyndall in support of unbelief. He says, Thus I have come more and more to look calmly on forms of religious belief to which I had in earlier years a pronounced aversion. Professor Arthur Thompson, one of our greatest authorities in natural science and an exponent of Darwinism and evolution, stated recently, nor can it be said that science engenders an irreverent spirit. The biographies of all the greatest scientific investigators show the reverse. The irreverent and the unwondering are to be found amongst those who know least, not among those who know most. When we realize the high position of this authority in the world of science, which we are justified in stating that this is the most convincing pronouncement ever made on behalf of science harmonizing with belief and religion, the unbeliever of the type mentioned, i.e. one of those who know least, boasts that he cannot understand and therefore does not believe his principle. He exclaims, I reject it. I worship what I can and do understand. My God is science. Let such a one listen to what Lord Kelvin said in his advanced age. One word characterizes the most strenuous of the efforts for the advancement of science that I have made perseveringly during 55 years 
that word is failure. I know no more of electric and magnetic force or of the relation between ether, electricity, and ponderable matter than I knew when I tried to teach my students 50 years ago in my first session as professor. As far as I can remember in recent years, the Methodist Church could boast of only one distinguished man of science. He was, however, unique inasmuch as whilst a minister of the gospel, he occupied the high position of president of the London Microscopic Society. Dr. Dallinger was the first exponent of science to place in its proper light the relationship of the miracles recorded in the Bible with the principles of the laws of advanced science. It is with the miracles of the Bible that the man who has got a smattering of science has the bitterest quarrel. The common definition of a miracle is that it is something caused by a suspension, alteration, or reversal of the laws of nature. Such a definition could never be accepted by the scientific mind. The laws of nature can never change. It was Dallinger who altered this old conception of a miracle and smoothed away all difficulties and obstacles which had hitherto stood in the way of a recognition of the possibility of the fact of a miracle being accepted by science. The true scientist now looks at this matter in a totally different light. He is daily investigating and experimenting with these laws of nature, testing and weighing them. He has learned that they were first called into being by some almighty power for a beneficent object. What's so natural to realize, what's so obviously true, as that the great creator of these laws can in a moment at his will control or so direct their operation as to produce any result which he requires. Thus, in Dallinger's view, no miracle was ever performed by any change, suspension, or reversal of a natural law. Its accomplishment was always effected in full accordance with the operation of nature's laws divinely guided by their author and creator for some special purpose or emergency. One might safely go further and reverently affirm that should any scientist discover, understand, and make himself master of these laws, he would be able to reproduce many of the miracles chronicled in the sacred record. It is impossible, however, to conceive that he could ever hope in his wildest dreams to attempt to perform the commonest of all miracles, prophecy. There is therefore nothing whatever to be said by science antagonistic to the possibility of miracles as the word is now understood. Nay, more, I believe that it is probable if a miracle had never been performed on earth and if the speculative question had been raised in an assembly of scientific men, is such a thing possible? The men of science would have answered in the affirmative. To the believer, well might we exclaim, O foolish man, what is bewitching you? You reject the divine record of every miracle, which cannot be explained by your own limited reasoning powers, whilst every day before your eyes the little grain of wheat on being cast into the ground, springs up into a plant bearing a hundredfold, or the acorn drops upon the sod, and there arises the stately oak of the forest. Truly, you strain at the gnat, and you swallow the camel. Do you look for the solution of the mystery in some generating influence in the seasons, or in some chemical action in the soil? You can get your answer to the first question from the poet Thompson who addresses the seasons thus. These, as they change, Almighty Father, these are but the varied God. The rolling year is full of thee, forth in the pleasing spring. Thy beauty walks, thy tenderness and love, wide flush the fields, the softening air is balm. Then comes thy glory in the summer months, with light and heat effulgent. Then thy sun shoots full perfection through sw the swelling year. Thy bounty shines in autumn unconfined and spreads a common feast for all that lives. Does the theory of some chemical action between the constituents of the soil and the germ and the seed satisfy you? Pause and think. 
into the same patch of brown Mother Earth, the gardener scatters a handful of mixed seeds. There arise bells of beaten gold, chalices of burning silver, blushing roses, and stately lilies decked with greater beauty than the rarest gems of earth, wafting odors of heavenly fragrance and shining with a luster that vies with the loveliness of the stars. When only one is in the sky, fruits and flowers more gorgeous in their freshness than all the panoply of the gaudy court of Solomon. Then pause again and think. The son of the great creator during his brief sojourn on earth had thought it necessary to stretch forth his almighty hand in Palestine, command a single petal to change its shape or color. The poor infidel of today would arise and blatantly protest that such a thing was impossible of belief. It is necessary to emphasize the folly of denying the truth of the recorded miracles, because very often, if not always, this is inseparable from the state of mind which rejects the very existence of a personal God. Moreover, the foundations of Christianity rest on a miracle. The keystone of the arch of our religion is a miracle, the resurrection of our blessed Redeemer, the stone which the builders rejected, it is one of the best attested facts in history. Upon the truth of it rests our hope of immortal life. For if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. It was only the other day that I was struck during my study of the Gospels by what was to me a new aspect of this miracle. The raisings from the dead recorded in the New Testament occur in persons who had died from disease and not from injury. This gives some excuse to the skeptical mind for believing that the individuals were not really dead, but in a state of coma or trance, from which a natural recovery was possible. Even the case of the youth who fell from the upper story whilst Paul was preaching at trust was not a case of raising, for the apostle assured his auditors that his life was in him. In the example of Christ on the cross, the soldiers were satisfied that his injuries were already mortal, but in order that no possible doubt should ever arise, we have the witness of the beloved disciple John, who tells us that he himself had witnessed the spear thrust of the Roman soldier, and the blood followed by water which flowed from the wound after the withdrawal of the weapon. The spear had certainly from either the right or left side of the chest pierced the Savior's heart after entering the membranous sac or envelope which loosely surrounds the heart. Thus all conceivable doubts about the reality of absolute death are annihilated. It would be presumptuous of me to appear before you as a scientist in the sense in which I have used this term, but pardon this reference to myself when I explain that for more than half a century it has been my lot to be engaged as a student, practitioner, writer, and professor of the science of medicine, the one science which utilizes the results and discoveries of every other department of scientific activity. Almost, I may say, hourly, it has been my duty to sift and weigh the value of evidence in the working of the laws of nature in the human organism, in health and disease keeping always before my mind the subject on which I am now speaking. I have lately read the Bible through from Genesis to Revelation three times, and I have failed to find a single statement which is not reconcilable with the most recent advances in scientific discovery. Once only had I any difficulty when I came upon the passage, Thou, son, stand still on Gibeon till I realized that this was merely a quotation from the lost book of Poetical Rhapsodies by Jasher. I find nothing in the Bible at variance with the evidence marshaled in favor of the theory of evolution, the age of man on our planet, or with the history of the earth as told by the oldest and newest geological formations. There is nothing in the history of controversy since its beginning about which so much so-called scientific nonsense has been written as about the first chapter of Genesis. Science tells us uncontrovertibly that millions of years elapsed during the formation of the rocks before man appeared, 
The unbelievers rejoiced that each geological discovery demolished more and more completely the biblical narrative, leaving not a fragment to survive. They forgot or overlooked the trifling point of punctuation. The sacred record begins thus, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and we have a full stop after the word earth, and there follows a new sentence, And the earth was waste and void. There is no denial here of any necessary millions of years during the creation, and who is to limit the millions of years between the full stop and the next sentence? Then again, between the second and third verses, there is another full stop or period, indicating a further gap of possibly millions of years between the brooding over the face of the water and the creation of light. The word moved is translated properly in the margin as was brooding upon and implies continuous action. Here, no reconcilement between religion and science is necessary. From the first line in the sacred oracle, there is complete harmony. Then the Darwinian theory of evolution was sprung upon the Christian world on the top of innumerable discoveries of the remains of primitive man in the shape of beautifully chipped arrowheads and cave decorations, which are believed by scientists to date back probably hundreds of thousands of years. Here, they say, we have the Bible proved at last to be a fable, and we need not wait to produce the missing link. Let us accept every item in the whole evolution doctrine and agree that life first began in a little shapeless mass of unorganized protoplasm, and from its lowliest form in this, up the highest developments in the apes and gorillas, reached its fullest development in man capable of endowment with such faculties as enabled him to chip flints for his arrows. These he learned the necessity for in order to kill his prey, fight his enemies, protect his mate, and defend his offspring. Science has been unable to give us any suggestion or evidence that his higher moral faculties, his sense of real right and wrong, his consciousness or sense of a higher invisible power with whom he could hold communion, and whose will he was bound to obey, that these divine attributes could evolve. Like his courage, instinct of self-preservation, from the necessities of his environment, even when we accept the evolution theory in its most advanced form, we are driven to acknowledge that at some developmental stage after the ape form a special miracle was necessary to introduce into primitive man's brute nature the divine element or attributes. Genesis gives us the account of this missing link in his nature, the soul added to the beast. God said, let us make man in our own image. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. A hurricane has swept over the whole fields of science, which marks 1921 as a most memorable year in the annals of philosophy. Einstein has launched his theory of space-time, fourth dimension, or relativity, This promises to shake many a scientific theory. I am not going to discuss it for the simple reason that I am not yet able to grasp its vast possibilities for influencing human thought and reasoning processes. It will, however, interest you to know how it is likely to influence our conceptions of God and what effect it may probably have upon our faith and our interpretation of God's will as set forth in the inspired volume. Dr. Weldon Carr, professor of philosophy in the University of London, who has already been expounding the Einstein theory in a volume published soon after the theory was launched, has within the past month been interviewed and reported in the press as saying that is going to produce a revolution in religious thought, whilst drawing from the idea of a separate or transcendent God. It interprets and throws light upon the idea of an eminent God and can only be interpreted in terms of an eminent God, a reality which in its very nature is life and consciousness. This leaves materialism as a worldview in the air. This view of the professor of philosophy tempts me to accompany him in his aerial flight and give utterance to a conception which has occupied my mind before relativity was sprung upon the scientific world though I am sure it would excite a smile from the most speculative disciple of the doctrine of the fourth dimension. It is that the mysterious something which we call ether and which pervades the entire universe, 
beyond the range of the fixed farthest star, which is at once as dense as steel and lighter than the faintest shadow of a cloud, may yet be proved by science to be God himself, omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. Or if you choose to think of God residing in his heaven with Christ by his right hand, you may think of the ether as that divine spirit which pervades all space, all time, and eternity, all dimensions, and capable of conveying to the throne of the eternal every prayerful vibration of the believer's heart. Such a view, unlike that of Professor Carr's above mentioned, is not necessarily a pantheistic conception, is quite compatible with the belief in the existence of a transcendent personal God in opposition to the philosophy of Spinoza or of Hegel. Chapter 2. The Higher Criticism in Relation to Unbelief In seeking an explanation of the spreading growth of unbelief, it is therefore, as we have seen, not to be found in any antagonism between faith and the rapid advance of scientific discovery. We must look in another direction. It unquestionably will be found in the teaching of the higher criticism. Here, at the start, there must be no room left for misunderstanding. There are two distinct kinds of higher criticism. The Bible, especially the Old Testament, has been much illuminated by severe and searching criticism in the light of the increased knowledge of the day, especially in the researches made in the domains of ancient history, philology, monumental discovery, and the unearthing of the sites of past civilizations. It would be a poor guide to erring man if the sacred book failed to respond to the ordeal of the most exacting scrutiny upon the same principles of strict and severe criticism as are today being applied to writings of a merely secular character. The grand old book comes out of this test as gold refined in the furnace. As far as one has been able to judge, not a single inscription unearthed from the ruins of the cities of Babylonia, Assyria, Egypt, or Palestine has contradicted any statement in the divine record. On the contrary, the monumental evidences hidden for thousands of years under the ruins of the cities of the East are now testifying to the accuracy of, or casting fresh light upon, the inspired chronicles. It is true we may have had to alter our views about the dates, arrangements, or structure, and even in a few cases of the authorship of one or two of the books in the Old Testament, as, for example, there is a very considerable agreement amongst scholars that the book of Isaiah was not all written by the son of Amos, and that a section of it was written at a later date than that of the prophet's lifetime. This change of view should, however, excite no fear or uneasiness in the mind of any Christian. It may afford some comfort to those who are not familiar with this kind of criticism if I say that after a careful survey of the results of this minute examination of the Bible, line by line, I find my own faith strengthened and not weakened. Moreover, I am absolutely convinced that the results of this severe but fair scrutiny of the sacred volume has never made one believer into an infidel or atheist. Therefore, I am compelled to say that we must still look in another direction for the cause of the spread of unbelief in these days. I cannot, however, leave the subject of this kind of criticism, which starts with the sole object of testing and illuminating the truth, without urging a caution. It may sound absurd and presumptuous in a layman to attempt a criticism of those scholarly men who have devoted their whole lifetime to the study of the Bible and of the ancient languages interwoven in its fabric. It chanced to happen that before I commenced to look into the subject of the higher criticism, 
I had been deeply interested in the endless controversy about the authorship of the works of Shakespeare, the dates and composite nature of some of the plays. I would not intrude this subject upon you, were it not that it bears most closely upon any consideration of the question of judging the accuracy of the Bible from its own internal evidence. The early books of the Bible are given to us as the work of Moses, who lived 3,500 years ago, and they are written in a partially lost tongue. Shakespeare's works were printed only 300 years ago, and in our own language. Nearly every literary scholar in England for the last half century has been studying the plays and poems. When these experts find some play which they think is due to the joint work of Shakespeare and some other dramatist of his time, they proceed to examine it line by line, so as to apportion the work to each. And what do we get as the result? The parts which one weighty author picks out as unquestionably Shakespearean are often the very lines selected by another great authority to demonstrate the fact that Shakespeare never saw the play. The Baconian theory is now discarded utterly. In 1914, we had an attempt made to prove that Sir Walter Raleigh was the real author. In 1919, a very able volume was published by Professor Abel Lefranc of Paris, powerfully supporting the claims of William Stanley, 6th Earl of Derby, under the title of Sous le Masque de Shakespeare. To prove still further the difficulties and uncertainties surrounding this comparatively simple problem, in 1920, a masterly volume appears from the pen of Looney, most plausibly and to many rather convincingly urging upon internal evidence that the entire plays and poems were the sole product of the genius of the Earl of Oxford of that day. Almost precisely the same results are seen in the attempts of those good men who have been led in the confidence of their great scholarship to piece out certain books, nay, even to piece out certain chapters or verses of the Bible, which they believe to be the sayings of different men living at different times. One biblical scholar maintains confidently that this psalm was written by David, Another of equal weight affirms from some slight peculiarity of style or structure that it was written after the exile, 500 or 600 years later. When one considers the difficulties of analyzing a modern work like Shakespeare, written in our own tongue, and contrasts them with the insuperable problem of dealing with writings in a partially lost language of 3,500 years ago, we may well refuse to let our faith be disturbed by any biblical alterations founded on points of philology or peculiarities of language. Many of these so-called alterations, though accepted as orthodox by scholars, are at their best but guesses. Their authors have been sometimes apparently merely casting lots for pieces of the one seamless garment of eternal truth which refuses to be made by man into a patchwork. We now come to the consideration of another kind of criticism, which we must unhesitatingly affirm to be the main cause of the unbelief of the present age. It is the source of all the poison which has paralyzed the faith of hundreds of thousands. It is as different from the system about which I have been speaking as darkness is from light. For all practical purposes, we may term it the German higher criticism, remembering that there are still a very few eminent scholars in that land of Coulter who reject it, just as there are, alas, very many in England who greedily accept its teaching, and some who even outvie in credulity their most advanced continental leaders. Let us make no mistake. The difference between the two systems of criticism is not one of degree. It is a radical one. This is not merely a matter of opinion, but one capable of proof to a demonstration. 
I was about to say that at every point you could divide these two systems with a knife edge, but I would rather put it that they are as widely divided as the eastern and western hemispheres are separated by the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The one system which, for convenience, I shall term the Old English Higher Criticism, approaches the examination of the sacred oracles with the object of arriving at the truth and abiding by the results of the investigation. The other starts in sheer, case-hardened unbelief, consciously or unconsciously denying absolutely the possibility of the supernatural. It may strike you as paradoxical that I should ask you to believe that these men are honest and actuated by a high motive. I believe that they are, or the majority of them are. We can arrive at this conviction from a study of their psychological or mental state later on. Starting with a calm and firm belief that there cannot possibly be such a thing as divine revelation or inspiration, miracle, or prophecy, they are convinced that the Bible has been wrongly interpreted by the poor, credulous people who swallow such impossibilities. Beginning with what is a pure assumption, and having human reason for their sole deity, everything in the Old Testament which clashes with this foregone conclusion or assumption must be ruthlessly denied, destroyed, or explained away. It seems incredible to conceive the maze of absurdities in which they lose themselves. At almost every turn, they find themselves brought up suddenly by a granite rock of truth in some verse. This they lightly dispose of by some such stereotyped phrase as, Oh, this is obviously an interpolation or addition or gloss by some later scribe, about which all scholars are agreed. The cardinal fact to be remembered is that never was one of these so-called German scholars turned from a believer into an atheist, infidel, skeptic, or deist by the results of his investigations. Unbelief was the origin and cause of his criticism from the start. It cannot be too strongly reiterated that the German higher criticism is the fruit of unbelief. It was not their tearing of the Bible to pieces which made them unbelievers, but it was because they were infidels that they tried to tear it into fragments. Professor Pusey has pointed out that this is simply an historical fact, a matter of chronology. German unbelief was older than the modern German criticism. German rationalists were forced on their criticisms by the necessity of their position. Their confident assertions are most unfortunately accepted by those who regard these German atheists as scholars or men of learning without examining their methods minutely or plumbing their shallowness. So the poison is poured out from many an English pulpit and on being swallowed by a man whose conscience tells him hourly that he is living at enmity with God, it sears his conscience as does a red-hot iron his body, and leaves him deaf to the still small voice within. This is not the occasion to criticize these critics. Perhaps in a future lecture I may take you over the ground covered by what is known as the Wattke Graf Kuhnen Wellhausen Stade rationalistic doctrine of the Pentateuch. I must content myself at present with only a few sentences summarizing my own experience of a searching study of this theory, which, however I must say, is not regarded in the light of a theory, but a series of established facts. Hearing from time to time quotations and scraps of this type of criticism, which disquieted me not a little, I shrank from an investigation of it. About three years ago, I became convinced that my attitude of mind was a cowardly one. If the orthodox biblical view was fallacious, it seemed better after all to know this than to live in a fool's paradise. I made the plunge and decided to abide by the consequences. I devoutly thank God that I did so. 
The light which I feared turned out to be not merely a will-of-the-wisp, but a mirage of the most silly speculations and groundless assertions, such as I had never before encountered in the study of any other subject. I found that the German higher criticism had nothing better to give me than the baseless assertion, unsustained by a single fact or sane argument, that no such personages as Abraham, Joseph, Joshua, Moses, or even David had ever existed. They were really astral myths like Jupiter, Mars, and Hercules. Our own Canon Chain, who had written the lives of some forty of those expositors, outherods them all in some of their most advanced assertions and mark the deadly nature of his poisonous stuff. He states that, One of my chief grounds for advocating such a criticism is that it appears to me to be becoming more and more necessary for the maintenance of true evangelical religion. Evangelical religion? If Abraham be a myth, where is our hope to rest? Destroy Abraham... And what becomes of our hope as Gentiles? In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Do away with Abraham and Moses, and you do away with Jesus Christ. Later on, when we approach the study of Daniel, we shall have to deal with others of our Anglo-German higher critics, like Archdeacon Farrar, who calmly assures us that part of the book of Daniel is only a religious romance after the manner of one of Shakespeare's plays, whilst Professor Driver, on the same book, stultifies himself in his feeble attempts to reconcile the views of the unbelievers with those of the true Christian. Pushed to their logical end, there is no escape whatever from the conclusion that, according to the German higher criticism, The whole of the Old Testament is a forgery. Lest some of you should think that my language is unwarrantably severe, let me conclude with a few remarks from Dr. Emil Reich, who has written several works on history, and who candidly states that in his earlier years he fully believed in the scientific character of the higher criticism. But, having learned more about life, and reality, he has come to the conclusion that it is bankrupt as a method of research and pernicious as a teaching of religious truth, a perversion of history, and a desecration of religion, a method long abandoned and despised by all real students of history. It is as antiquated and obsolete as it is unsound and perverse, and stands condemned by history fully as much as by true religion. He says, It must be made clear to the millions of honest people who want to use their Bibles as their strongest and most comforting consolation for life and afterlife that all the arguments of the higher critics have so far not been able to move a stone from the edifice inside which over a hundred generations have sought and found their spiritual bliss. To myself, the view presented by the critics' reconstructed Bible appears exactly comparable with the descriptions of a harmonious landscape given by a man who has been blind from his birth, and I pledge myself to fairly demonstrate the truth of this simile later on. You will ask yourselves, how is it possible to apply such unqualified censure to the laborious researches of a host of men many of them entitled to be called scholars. After all, some of you may say these questions are matters of opinion, and one side may be as well qualified to arrive at the truth as the other. Is there any possible explanation which can convince us that this type of criticism is out of court? Is there any solution of the riddle that can convince a doubter that these men are unworthy of serious attention and credence? Remember, there can be no compromise or reconcilement of the higher criticism of German origin within Christian belief. There is no halfway house. I can confidently answer this question in the affirmative. 
In the next lecture, by the use of scientific methods, I hope to explain the nature and cause of unbelief.